Good morning, guys. How's everybody doing? Who says sleepy? So, somebody said sleepy earlier. It's okay to be a little sleepy. Um, like Blake said, I'm Steve Herndon. I'm a drug addict and alcoholic. And uh, I'm here to talk to you today about a lot of stuff. Uh, most importantly, uh, every decision you make on a daily basis, how it impacts you. So how many non-players do we have in here right now? Do we have any eyeballs that, I, that I'd like to have turn away? If, 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 if we, maybe everybody could commit to close, close their eyes for, for a second, just so I can get a vote from the players without anybody seeing it, because it, it's going to obviously skew w the questions that I'd like to ask. So having said that, if you could, if you're not a player, OK, close your eyes, all right? Um, all right, nobody's gonna raise their hand now, right? Everybody's like, yeah, yeah. All right, all right, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. I do, the eyes are closed. In, in, who, in, who in here drink? Anybody in here drink? Okay. Anybody in here try any dope? Any kind of recreational drug, ecstasy, smoke weed, done any of that? Okay, all right, I appreciate your honesty. Um, all right, we can get the eyes open again. Blake, and I also failed to mention, uh, I want to thank Blake, JP, and uh, the entire coaching staff for giving me the opportunity to come speak to you because one of my passions is obviously helping people in recovery. Um, I'm, I've been very blessed for the last 10 and a half years to, to be drug and alcohol free. I never knew my biological father, but I knew he was an alcoholic and I, and I would never be like him. And um, we know how that turned out, right? Because uh, I'm here today to talk to you about making decisions and making the right ones. Um, I, I, n I never dreamed that I would go down the road that I went down. Um, but I didn't know as, as a very young man uh, at, at five years of age that I wanted to play football. That's what I wanted to do. That was the most important thing in the world to me. And... Uh, <clears throat> But, but drinking and, and drugging was not part of the equation. Um, so I was born and raised in LaGrange, Georgia. We got any folks from LaGrange in here? We used to have a couple folks from LaGrange. Nobody from LaGrange? No? Okay. Keep coming back, as they say. Um, anyway, LaGrange is about an hour south of Atlanta. And pretty much the only thing to do in LaGrange is play football. And, and what I learned at a very early age was that um, because I didn't have a biological father, I was seeking validation, and what I learned is that the harder I hit people, the more validation I got, right? Atta boy, huh? Atta boy, good hit, right? How many, how, raise your hand if you like that, right? Everybody, we all love that, right? And so what I learned was that that validation was on the football field, and so that's what I did. I, I didn't drink and drug in high school. Um, I like to say I was a, I was a good kid, you know? Um, and so it, drugs and alcohol were just never going to be something that I was going to have to deal with. I can remember um, throughout my time in, at Georgia and in the NFL, we'd have guys like me come in and speak. And I'd say, okay, here we go. Here's another crackhead. You can tell me about his sob story. And uh, I mean, it's just truth. It's just, it wasn't something that was going to be a problem for me because it wasn't even on the table. Um, <clears throat> there are some warning signs. Uh, and one of the things that I want to talk to you guys about today, outside of making good decisions, is really looking after one another. So I started one year of high school football. I started my junior year uh, at Troop County High School in LaGrange. And going into my senior year, I was like top 100 recruit in the country. I pretty much could have picked wherever I wanted to go to school. And I ended up going to the University of Georgia. And on my recruiting trip, I found alcohol, and what I found was that alcohol validated me the same way football validated me. So I now had my drug of choice on the field, which was football. Then, my, then I had my drug of choice off the field, which was alcohol. So I was getting validated. It was a two-way street. Now, <clears throat> I had a little bit of a problem. I don't know if anybody here can relate to this. I had a lot of offers from all over the country, but I couldn't pass the SAT, you know? 
And, and I felt like I was a pretty decent kid. I, I worked hard in school. I had like a 3.3 GPA. And uh, for whatever reason, I just, I, I would get out of the car and I'd be soaking wet, sweating, you know, getting ready to take the SAT. Anybody relate to that? Anybody? We got, we got a, come on now, we got a couple hands. We got some bright students in here. A, a, ACT? Well, I mean, I took it all. I took, like, I took the ACT probably 20 times. I took the SAT 20 plus times. I just couldn't pass it. Yeah, I mean, so I had to combine, like, I had to combine test scores in order to get into the University of Georgia. So I know you guys can relate to this. Um, so everybody in my hometown was like, yeah, this, he'll be home washing cars in two months. Most of you sitting in this room are here because of what? Because you want to prove all the non-believers wrong, right? Anybody seen the uh, Bart Scott video? To all the non-believers? Anybody? Please tell Come on, guys. You got to read up now. Um, Bart Scott had a post-game interview with, uh, I, I forget who it was. But anyway, the, I mean, literally, like, he's flying in, like, he's flying on a plane. He was like, to all the non-believers, especially you, Tom Jackson. That, that's who, that was me. I was like, to all the non-believers that said I was going to be home washing cars in two months. No, because what the SAT and ACT didn't prove is that with hard work and determination, you can do anything you want to do. And I'm going to tell you a little more about that, too, because that's a fact. Another question, how many, how, many, how many of you guys sitting in this room would like to have a degree from this school? Okay. How many guys sitting in this room would like just an opportunity to play in the National Football League. Okay, all right, fair enough. Because I wanted both too. I want, I, I wanted, I wanted a degree from Georgia, but also wanted to play, play in the National Football League. I mean, I was, you know, I didn't have anybody throw a football with me. I have, uh, I have three kids today, and I try to get my son out in the yard. I'm like, bro, I'll throw with you all day. Like, I didn't have anybody to throw the ball with me. So let's get out in the yard and let's throw. So I get to Georgia, and on my, like I said, on my recruiting trip, I turned into a Power Ranger, and that was a warning sign, right? I mean, you know, we laugh, and, but seriously, like, you know, you, you guys probably have some of you boys you hang out with that are sitting next to you that they may or may not turn into a Power Ranger, but some crazy stuff happens, right, when they drink. I mean, I was just one of those guys, like, crazy stuff happened when I drank. Even crazier stuff happened later on. Um, but you know, for four years, man, I just, I could turn the switch on and off. I had a motto, who with the owls, soar with the eagles. Who with the owls, soar with the eagles. So in other words, it's okay if I shut the bar down, but I've gotta be the first one on the field and I gotta be first in every drill. So uh, to me, like if I could honor that commitment, <coughs> What did it matter if I went out and had a little fun, right? We're in college. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be having fun. Everybody agree with that? And that's where things get a little bit tricky uh, for, for guys like us. And I say us because we are a brotherhood. That's why um, I, I love helping people and talking to people about making decisions and, and doing the next right thing. But when I get to come in and look you guys in the eye, and say, listen, man, I know exactly how you feel. I know exactly where you're wanting to go. Let's talk about how we can help you guys get there. Um, so back to Georgia, I, was, I, I wanted to prove everybody wrong. I wasn't going to be washing cars in, in, in two months. And I did that. Now, how did I do it? I, I was in study hall about 25 hours a week. And I know you guys are blessed to have a lot of resources at your fingertips. And I wanna encourage you on a daily basis to utilize those resources. Utilize them to the best of your ability and get your degree, okay? First and foremost, get your degree. I, I was very blessed, I graduated from Georgia. Uh, even amidst my, my alcoholic binge drinking, I graduated in four years with a 3.3 GPA. And uh, nobody can ever take that away from me. You know, to all the non-believers, and you guys should pull that up later on. You'll love it because that's what it's about. You know, to all the non-believers. How many, how many people are picking you guys to win the conference this year? Anybody? 
Huh? You go watch that video, I promise you. You guys can do it. You can do it. To all non-believers. So I was drinking a little bit, but big deal. I was team captain, right? They, get, they have this award at Georgia. It's called the Leon Farmer Strength and Conditioning Award. And they give it to the player who dedicates the most to the program. I was a Leon Farmer winner. So obviously, I honored my commitment. I could shut a bar down, but I, I was also finishing first in every drill out on the field. Part of that problem, though, is that that fed into my denial. I went smoking crack under a bridge. I had a degree from Georgia. So surely I don't have a problem. Although I had been told, you know, hey, I know you've never met your biological father, but he is an alcoholic. And genetics guys play a huge role in this piece, okay? And then you throw in the pressure that, that we have sitting in this room to perform. Then you throw in the pressure of the classroom. Then you throw in this pressure, that pressure, girl, family, you name it. And they say, you know, you got a lot of pressure. And what do you do with it? You know, you run out, run out on the field and hit somebody hard. Yeah, that helps. The problem is when it turns into more than just going out and having a couple of drinks. And, and that's what happened with me. So I had already graduated from Georgia, but I still had one more year because I redshirted. And so I had my senior year, which was in 1999. <clears throat> I had drank, I think, about a half gallon of Jim Beam. And I was, I was pretty close to probably laying down real soon. And it was still daylight. And for what it's worth, I know you, think, you guys think this is funny. This was before it was cool to be a white boy listening to rap music. This was, uh, cause especially down in LaGrange, Georgia. Uh, my best friend since middle school, we were going to be rappers and NFL football players. <laughs> I mean, straight up, dog, like Pete Rock and CL Smooth, that was, that was, you know, when they reminisce, that's like I could, call, I could call my boy right now and just drop the record, he'll start crying. Because that was our stuff, man. Like, we, we grew up bef way before it was cool to, like, listen to rap. Like, and, and we were, like, New Balance and Polo-type kids. You know, we were being who we were. We were from the country. We were just country boys. But we, we like rap music, you know? And, and we got hammered for liking rap music. And, and so it was always baffling. So that's what I say. To all the non-believers, you guys can do anything you want to do if you put your mind to it. Because I promise you, two white kids from LaGrange, Georgia, that set out to become NFL football players and rappers? I mean, for real, dog. Look, we went to Radio Shack. We bought a mic and a mixer. Nothing, nothing to, like, make the sound come out. No amp, no speaker, nothing. We went to his garage, and we were like, all right, dog, we ready now. <laughs> what, what, were, what exactly were we ready for? I, I don't know. You know, and that's why I try to live today. Like, stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. You know, because we were we wasn't about to record anything. You feel me? Um, we weren't about to record anything yet. Um, so I, I drank like a half gallon of Jim Beam. And my buddy who would eventually get in the music industry, he, he came up to me. And he said, man, he said, I promise you, eat this pill right here. He's like, he said, you, you will not be mad at me tomorrow. And he was right. I wasn't mad at all. Within an hour, I literally almost fell down, and I was like looking for him. I was trying to like hold myself up, and I ran over to him, and I was like, dog, what is this? And then God came down from the sky, and he said, son, you have been blessed. This is, this is some of the purest ecstasy that, 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 that we have out. And, and, and sitting no, I'm dead serious, folks. And, and uh, and that was when I had like, okay, well, maybe there's more than just alcohol out there. Like, because this was some good fire right here. Um, and then, then a couple weeks later, I had like three, well, the dude tried to give me like one hit of acid, which would have been plenty. And you know how, you know, as a football player, you didn't give me nothing. Are you trying to hose me? And it, next thing I know, dude dropped like three or four hits of, of, of liquid acid in my mouth and the devil showed up. I mean, he showed up real quick because we had bowl practice the next morning. I had my girl at my apartment, and she, she wasn't supposed to know about any of this, right? It was not a good experience. I mean, for real. When I say the devil showed up, um, it was real bad. 
Now, the crazy thing about the disease of addiction is guess what I was doing within a couple weeks? Was I doing more XC or acid? I was doing acid again. Next thing I know, I'm doing acid all the time. But I had a, um, going into my senior year, I had a uh, third round uh, projection with the draft projection, which pff, whatever, man, to all the non-believers, right? To all the non-believers. I, I uh, going into my senior year, I had a third round grade and, and we were playing Kentucky and I went out to, to make a block and got extended and tore my shoulder up. And I decided to continue to play on it. That was a, a bad decision. Um, but, you know, I, I was trying to do what I thought was the right thing to do. Long story short, we, uh, we finished the bowl game. And in January of 2000, uh, I had complete uh, reconstruction of my right shoulder. And they said I may never play again. Said, you know, you, 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 you might, but chances are you'll never play again. So guess what? Combine, I got an invite to the combine, but I went to the combine and stood around. That doesn't exactly look good, you know, if you're trying to impress teams. Um, I played offensive line, by the way. That was about 60 pounds ago, and I don't really work out anymore. So um, not that that's any relevance, but you might. And I'm going to try to leave a little bit of time at the end, so let me know when I've got about uh, 10 minutes at the end. I would like to open it up for questions. Um, but guess what? When I had surgery, they gave me these pills, and it was like 90 of them in there. And I was like, dang, man, 90, that's a lot. So let me see, what, let's see what's up with these pills. Lower tab, it didn't mean nothing to me at the time, but I was like, okay, pop a couple in. Shoulder felt good. I was like, well, if two's making my shoulder feel better, I wonder what a couple more will do. Within a matter of a week, the pills were gone, and I still ain't been to the bathroom. And uh, that's when I fell in love with opiates. And because I was able to turn the switch on and off, like I wasn't like doing drugs all the time. I wasn't even drinking all the time. Because I could turn that switch on and off, or so I thought, I didn't think I had a problem. Long story short, I ended up going undrafted. Uh, I signed with the Miami Dolphins as an undrafted free agent. I couldn't bench press 135 pounds. I had no business being on the field. You know, I'm sure you guys have, have heard the joke, like dudes gonna get somebody hurt playing like that. Like I was gonna get somebody hurt. Cause I mean, I just, I, I was not, I wasn't even, I couldn't even have played at Georgia, much less getting thrown around in the league. The good news is the, uh, the Dolphins released me. I could have I could have gave up. You know, I could have said, nah, that's it. You know, I tried, I didn't make it. But do we do that? If you're sitting in this room, I guarantee you we don't do that. And that was part of what fed into my disease, right? Because we don't quit at any cost, whether it's playing on the football field or whether it's drinking and drugging. And that's what I want to get you guys to start thinking about today and, and I'm, again, I'm not here to, you know, don't drink and drug and all that stuff. I mean, that, we, we all know now that the just say no stuff didn't work, right? I mean, we got, we, got a, we got a crisis across America today that's in epic proportions right now. So just say no doesn't work, but it's about what are the signs? You know, looking after your brother next to you, what are the signs that maybe we need to be looking for? Um... I knew Denver was interested in me because I got a phone call from Shanahan and, during the draft. And <laughs> this is funny. Um, yeah, we, you, we got like three picks left. We're probably going to take you with one of our last picks. Well, of course they didn't. But I knew they were interested in me. So I was like, let me go out to Denver and see what's up. So in 2000, I spent the whole year on the practice squad. And at the time, I thought that was an insult, like practice squad. And this was back when we only had five practice squad players. And still, like, I think it's eight now. At the time, it was a real, it was an honor to actually be there. And I was really happy just to be rehabbing my shoulder. And by, by actually, by the middle of the season, my shoulder was healthy. I was playing the best ball of my life. The other thing I wasn't doing is I wasn't really drinking and drugging heavy. Yet. Now think about that. I just told you about my binge drinking at Georgia. I told you about uh, experimenting with ecstasy, smoking weed. I didn't tell you about that, but I you know, smoke weed, but I mean, weed's no big deal, right? Alcohol is actually the worst thing for you. I mean, that's the reality. It just takes 30 years to do what you know, meth does in a year. Um, so 
I'm, it's just 2000, I'm middle of the season. I'm playing the best ball of my life. And uh, 2001, I came home to visit my buddy that was in the music industry. Remember I told you we were gonna be rappers and NFL football players? Well, he just so happened to have the number one video on Carson Daly uh, at the time. Does anybody remember that, Carson Daly? Anybody? Mm -mm. Did they even, does anybody in here even remember when they had videos on MTV? Your MTV raps? Yeah, there's, there's a few. Anybody in here heard of Bubba Sparks? Okay, I'll blow his anonymity, that's, that's my boy. And so in 2001, I drove back to Athens yeah, Bo Sparks. I drove back to Athens, and he's like, he's got me in the car, and he's crying. He's like, yo, man, he's like, he's like, man, this powder's got me, man. I'm like, powder's got you? What? He was like, yeah, man, this cocaine, man, it's got me. I'm like, man, you just weak-minded. Like, I'll show you how to do it, and then put it down. This is what we call good drug addict thinking right there, right? But I had overcome so many obstacles. I mean, I made a 490 on the PSAT, you know? So I had overcome so many things in my life. I was like, I'll, I'll do the cocaine tonight, and then I, and I'll never pick it up again. Well, we know how that turned out. Not very good. 2002 rolls around, and uh, I had an opportunity to start for the Denver Broncos. And over, over the course of six years uh, in the league, I started probably like 13 games. I was a good, solid backup. Um, could have been much more. I don't know. Did some of the decisions that I made prior to the opportunity of getting in the league affect what happened in the league? I'd like to think so. I'd, I'd like to think that had I made some better decisions, even at the University of Georgia, I might even been in a whole different situation. You know, I mean, obviously I hurt my shoulder and that had nothing to do with, well, I made a bad decision too to, on that play. But the point is, every day you wake up, you, you have an opportunity to make the right decision. And it's, and it's up to you guys looking after one another. We as men, especially you guys in this room, we don't know how to ask for help. And you guys have a lot of resources available to you. And learning how to ask for help is, is so critical. And not, and not just in, in football, but in the game of life. Because the more willing you are to ask for help and to get vulnerable, the bigger your world's going to expand. So I ended up, uh, I spent four years with Denver Broncos, and one of my passions today, um, I own and operate a sober living called Safety Net Recovery in Atlanta, Georgia. We've, we've also got locations in Greenville, South Carolina, and Charlotte, North Carolina. I tell you that to tell you that one of my passions today is working with the NFL Substance Abuse Program. And the reason I'm passionate about it is because I was one of those guys. Now, what, you, what they don't tell you is when they, by the time the guys get on ESPN, that's like their third or fourth offense. The first strike, they actually, you know, they keep it, you know, private and quiet and whatnot. And uh, so in Denver, we always knew we were going to get drug tested. It was always going to be in August. So what do we do? We shut it down a couple months before, right? And we didn't have nothing to worry about. My, my wife was on to something. I, I, I met my wife at Georgia and... She knew that in 2004, going back to Atlanta, there was the potential to be getting with my buddy in the music industry. And so she drew up a contract and said, no drugs. I'm like, that's fine, no problem. Get back to Atlanta, um, where well, I ended up signing with the Atlanta Falcons in 2004. Dream come true, right? Georgia boy, being able to go home, play in the dome, play for the Falcons. And uh, my, my wife was on to something. She drew up a contract, said no drugs. I'll never forget it. Um, we got in a fight, and my boy came over, and I had no intentions of doing any kind of drugs. I'm, I'm trying to make a good impression with the Atlanta Falcons. And um, the problem I really have with the substance abuse program is, is not only just the, the testing protocol, but what they do with players once they get in the program. I don't think that they truly understand the disease of addiction and how it needs proper treatment. But anyway, but, so I, I get in a fight with my wife, and my buddy is sitting there, and he's like going around to the side of the car, and I'm like, what are you doing, man? He's like, man, I know you got football and everything. I'm not trying to get you in any trouble. And I was like, 
are you holding on me? He was like, man, I'm not, I'm not trying to like do that. I said, bro, if you holding on me, we got a problem. He was like, all right, man, here you go. Throws me an eight ball. Now, good at it thinking. We had OTAs, we had a brand new coach. We had OTAs on Monday. This was on Friday night. I used all the coke until it was gone. And then all of a sudden I thought, wait a minute, we got practice Monday. I wonder if the Falcons drug test at a different time. Oh, I ain't even sweating that. 50 Cent said you can sweat it out in the uh, sauna, right? Then what 50 Cent? He said, I mean, did, come on, guys. 50 Cent, nobody, nobody's ever heard that song. <laughs> <laughs> Cocaine coming out of a poisonous sauna, right? At least for me, that, that worked. I was like, well, 50 said it worked, so it'll work for me. So guess what I did? On Sunday, I spent the whole day in the Falcons facility. I was up in the sauna the whole day, like cramping up walking out of there. But I was like, surely it's out of my system. And I was just rolling the dice on the fact that I didn't know whether or not I was going to be drug tested on Monday. But as, as, as fate would have it, I walk into the building that morning and guess what the sign said? NFL substance abuse offensive line. Now, I got put into the program, which was actually the best thing that could have happened to me. Um, I wasn't really working a program of recovery, which they wanted to put me in inpatient treatment and do a bunch of other stuff. And they were using words that really scared me off. And that's one of the things that I want to help them understand is that if they would not use words like hospitalization, they might not have ran me off the way they did. But I said, look, I'm not going to no hospital. I was like, y'all can drug test me, you know, I'll see a therapist, but I'm not going to a hospital. You might want to take a guess, best year I had in the NFL, over a six year career, was in 2004 with the Falcons. We ended up playing the Eagles in the championship game. We lost, uh, lost and, and we lost the opportunity to play in the Super Bowl. But, I mean, it, it, I mean, what are the chances, right? The one year that I'm not drinking and drugging, I had the best year of my career. I backed up every position along the offensive line. And uh, they actually gave out an MVP trophy to the five starting offensive linemen and myself. And uh, it's one of the, the greatest accomplishments that, to me, that, that I achieved on the field. Because at Georgia, we never won anything. And then, of course, in the league, I never won anything either. So um, I tell you all that just not because I, I, I want to brag about it, but I just wonder, like, how, how good could it have been? You know, not just my time at Georgia, but what, what could I have done in the league? You know, had I not been drinking and drugging? Fast forward a little bit. Ten minutes? Okay. Um, there's so much to cover, guys, and, I, and so little time. Um, let's put a wrap on, on, on the... 05. So 2004, I backed up every position. I thought I was going to play another 10 years. What I didn't tell you guys is that I can remember in 2002 with the Denver Broncos, there, there is, uh, if you watch the TV version, and we know in here, like, the TV version is completely different than what we, what we watch on, on film for, for players and coaches. But on the TV version, you can see me going back. We're playing, I, I, was playing, I was starting for the Denver Broncos. We're playing in Oakland. And you can see me going to the line of scrimmage, and I'm tugging on the guy next to me every single time we go to the line of scrimmage. Why am I tugging on him? I didn't know to play. Because guess what I was thinking about? Get that, hit, hit that blunt. That Crown Royal is going to taste so good. And, and then whatever I cram up my nose is just bonus, right? Guys, to a man, every one of us sitting in this room, that was my childhood dream. And I'm living out my childhood dream, and all I can think about is doing dope. I, and I'm not insinuating that anybody in here is thinking about that. My hope that is that when we walk out of this room, it just kind of sparks a little bit of thought in your brain as to, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to have to go down that road that, that that guy had to go down. I mean, think about all the obstacles to all the non-believers, like all the obstacles that I was able to overcome. But when it came to the disease of addiction, I, ha I had no chance. I didn't have a fighting chance. October 14, 2006, um, like I said, in 05, my career, like, 
it just ended overnight. I had a plethora of injuries. And uh, <coughs> October 14, 2006, I entered rehab. And for the last 10 and a half years, I've been doing a lot of this right here, you know. And, and, and if one of you leave this room and something I said resonates, then, then that's a win, you know. Um, so, decisions. Every single day, you get a choice to make decisions. And what I try to do every single morning is say, okay, do the next right thing. Well, I don't always know what the next right thing is, but what I always do is say, you know what, if I don't want my name or whatever it is I'm about to do on a billboard on 285 in Atlanta, then that's probably not the next right thing. Does that make sense to everybody? So think about whatever popular street or wherever it is around here. If you don't want it on a billboard, that's probably not the next right thing, you know? And so I encourage you every day when you wake up, think about the decisions you have the opportunity to make that could impact the rest of your life, you know? And, 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 and it was such a God thing. I walked in this morning and, and on your board out there, it said decisions. And you know, not only do they impact you guys individually, but it impacts everybody. You know, you, you guys, what a blessing, man, to represent an SEC school, a wonderful institution like Mississippi State. I mean, God, this, it, take advantage of it, you know, enjoy it. And, and um, my information, if anybody, when we leave here, and you don't, you don't want to ask a question in front of the group, but you just would like to pick my brain about anything, whether it's substance abuse related, whether it's, you know, you know the league, whatever it may be, um, I'm sure you can talk to some of the staff and, you know, you can get my cell phone and give me a call and I'm available 24-7. I'm kind of an open book and uh, you can go track me down online, so I'm not worried about that. So um, I'm going to open it up for questions. Thank you guys for having me. Um, and, and again, if you don't want to ask a question right now, you can get my cell phone later on and, and give me a call. Anybody got any questions about making decisions? Yes, sir. So I was very blessed that 10 and a half years ago um, when I got into recovery, I had really taken my wife through the ringer. We've been together 18 years. Um, the last thing I told her when my parents drug me out of my house for the intervention was when I find you, bitch, I'm going to fucking kill you. And I meant it with everything that I was. Granted, I was in a paranoid delusion from being up on cocaine for about a week. And I called the cops three times because the ninjas were breaking in. Um, so. <laughs> There was good reason why she let me sit in treatment for 30 days with no phone call. Um, the miracles of recovery, that's, why, that's what's, you know, giving me my three kids. So, um, but that's, that's a great question. Who else? Yes and no. I made the decision that day to eat that pill. You know what I'm saying? No one, he, he never, you know, stuck a gallon of crown down my throat. By the way, they do make gallon crowns. I don't, sometimes it's probably, it's only half a gallon. That, but he never, he never crammed any of that down my throat. Now, it was there. So, um, and part of what fueled, you know, our, both of us is, is the fact that we had some, you never gonna play in a league, you know, a white rapper. I mean, we got to remember now, this was back when like Eminem had just come on the scene, you know, like when he blew. So it was like unheard of. So, no, it fueled our disease, though. And, 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 and as two um, young kids with a pocket full of money, man, we were, we were a problem. I mean, we would, we would track each other down. And there were, and there were times where he would show up in, in Denver and, you know, I'd hit a line of cocaine at 6.30 and, and go run 110s at, at 7.30. And how I didn't die, I truly believe is... The reason I didn't die is so that I can, you know, be here today to, to share my experience, strength, and hope with you guys, you know. And there were times where he would have, it seemed like, you know, every time we got together, there was something big happening. He'd have a photo shoot. We had the video shoot. And we'd be up all night, you know. And um, I don't want you guys to have to go through that. So, yes, sir. Yes. Yes. He, well, well, he drinks. Okay. So, here's what I'll say is, um, he was really serious about recovery and was clean and abstinent for about a year and a half. And uh, really just 
<laughs> having to go back out on the road. He, you know, it, it, and I've told him, I said, you know, until you are done with Bubba Sparks, it's going to be real hard to, to, to stay sober. And he knows that. Um, and I just, I'll, I'll say that uh, he's got a Netflix series that's about to come out, hopefully. And, and hopefully that's going to be, you know, a new life for him.